a little better now. Hi, everybody. My name is Mallory Crooks, and I'm the public relations manager at the Ability Center. I'm just going to wait one more minute to see um, if we have any other attendees that are filing in, and then we'll get started. Mallory, can you hear me? I can Gary. vaguely hear you, Gary. Um, for some reason, I can't get my video to work. And, I can get the video um, to work. And the phone I called in, because I usually go through my phone because I have such a poor connection for the computer. So I go through my phone as well. So I, I mute my computer. But mm -hmm. I can't do that now because nobody's answering the phone. It's somebody that run through the phone. It should come through with Zoom, right? That's the call in. I think you're able to, to call in. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, am I still coming pretty rough right now? Yeah, if you want to hop off and then try to call in, I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> you're breaking up a little bit, so. Sorry about that. I'm wondering if I can. That helps out. Let me see something. All right. Something just happened. Our, our power and internet went out. Am I back? Yep. You're yes. here. <laughs> All right, so I think we're gonna get moving. We got a lot of great conversation to have. So I just wanna thank everyone for hopping on. We do have a lot of wonderful panelists. So we wanna keep comments brief to give everyone a chance to share. So I'm actually going to put the names and titles in the Zoom chat. And then if anyone has questions at the end, they can just use the hand waving function. Um, we're also gonna be sharing this on Facebook Live on the Ability Center's page. And then all the attendees and panelists will receive a PDF document that has language guidelines. And then also the recording will be sent to all staff, all attendees, I said all staff. <laughs> um, so I invite Tanisha to take it over now and she's gonna be the one facilitating the conversation. Okay, there we go. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanisha Ulrich. I will be serving as moderator today. Um, I'm currently a member of the Ability Center Board. Um, this project was born from a discussion. Uh oh. Hmm. I think there are a lot of us having issues right now. With the connection, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, keep, mine keeps going on and off, actually. Okay, so I hear you, you now. Go ahead, Tanisha. Okay, I'll start, uh, I'll start again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanisha Ulrich. I'll be serving as moderator today. Um, I'm currently a member of the Ability Center Board. Um, this project was born from a discussion that I was having with Mallory Crooks um, about a new story that I was a part of. Um, I mentioned to Mallory that a lot of the positive impact that the, the story had brought was negative impacted by some of the words, the words, stereotypical words that were used. Um, in the intro, they described me as a, someone that was wheelchair bound. Um, and that term for me is always hard um, because my wheelchair, I consider it to be my freedom. Um, and it's freedom to move around, uh, freedom to navigate the world. Um, and, you know, everyone makes mistakes. So um, we're here today to give folks a safe place to learn, ask questions, and form connections for questions that they may have in the future. So that's why we're all here today. And I'd like to start with the first question. Um, the words we choose are so important to how we portray uh, people in the media. So I'd like to ask Katie 
please explain the difference between first person language. Oh, please explain why it is so important to use person first language when speaking to or about someone with a disability. As an example, um, saying that someone, saying someone who uses a wheelchair Um, so I think Tanisha froze again, but so long as everybody can hear me, I'll start answering the question. And um, if she has anything else to add, we can go from there. But hi, everyone. I'm Katie. So I am a wheelchair user. And like Tanisha said, using terms such as wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair can be really negatively it can really negatively, you know, impact not only our perceptions of ourselves, but, uh, you know, others' perceptions of people with disabilities. Um, you know, as Tanisha mentioned, I see my wheelchair as a way to provide me with freedom and independence and a way to move around my community. But not only that, I am not bound to my wheelchair. I also utilize a walker so I can get out of my wheelchair. My wheelchair is not my only form of transportation to get myself around the world that I live in. So in using terms like wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair, you're really limiting the scope of the person's experience without really knowing what that person's experience is. In speaking to that also, you know, it's saying, that someone is a disabled person or, or heaven forbid a handicapped person is just really kind of outdated and not really what we want you know to how we want to talk about people with disabilities we're people first and you should always use person first language when referring to a person with a disability because they are people a disability is part of who they are and it influences you know their life but that's not all of who they are first and foremost we are people um tanisha do you have anything else that you wanted to ask i just kind of went for it <laughs> yeah well, i'm glad that you did because i was having some connection problems there um yeah um i think that uh basically what you said there covered it, um, especially how I felt about it. Um, I know that uh, that's, that's an, a big issue for us. Um, so I'll move on to the next one, because um, I don't think we have Gary. So um, we have um, Renee and Dan, and they've been advocates in the community writing for equal rights for many years. So I would like to start with um, Renee. Could you explain to us the phrase, nothing about us without us? What that means is for many, for a long, long, long time, people with disabilities have not been included in the conversation about what's going on in their own life, like, for example, when they make a policy that has to do with people with disability, many of us are at the table. Many of us are included in the conversation, and yet these are rules and policies that's gonna affect our lives. So when we say nothing about us with us, if you're gonna talk about disability issues, you need to have somebody at the table with a disability. You can't just make decisions about us without our input. And let's go with especially truthful for, for, um, 
for people with speech impairments. A lot of times we're totally left out because people think we can't communicate. So it's important to include Anything else? Yeah, I think um, that's a great answer. Um, I like um, what you were saying at the end there about what well, about how um, there's other ways that they can find to communicate if somebody has a, a speech impairment. There's so many different ways that they could come up with to find creative solutions to bring those people to the table um, when coming up with legislation, when coming up with anything that affects um, somebody that has a speech impairment. And so I'd like to ask, turn around and ask Dan the same question, because I know Dan and I, we've talked a little bit about this before. We both really like um, this um, and uh, he was excited about it. And so was I, nothing about us without us. Please explain that phrase, Dan. Uh, well, uh, it, it came here in 1994, actually that phrase. And I brought it here from Iceland, actually. I got it from a, a gentleman from South Africa. So. It is a wonderful phrase, but it really does go back to, um, you know, what we were talking about with uh, person first language and all of that. So much of the way we are referenced or talked to or talked about or uh, have decisions made about us, um, uh, they're all framed from a, from a perspective of, of ableist thinking. And that is, you know, if you're not living with a disability, all you can do is go on what you think you know. Uh, and so what we have are a lot of people out there who hear words like wheelchair bound and confined and they think that we can't, we shouldn't, we couldn't, um, and we won't and all of that stuff. And, and it's just not true. Um, you know, historically, there have been many, many people out there uh, living with disabilities that have contributed to where we are as a civilization. And, um, and, and you can just go Google famous people with disabilities, and you'll find all kinds of things. And a lot of people out there that you didn't know are people living with disabilities. But we have this frame of reference as non-disabled people in positions of power. And we can sure, uh, you know, it's based on what we think we know historically. And so uh, we make these decisions that really don't move people with disabilities forward, that don't create uh, welcoming communities and all of that, because we are thinking from, from uh, outdated um, misperceptions and, and old, uh, old theories on disability. So, it is really important that you include people with disabilities at the table because then you get the real deal. You get real issues, real problems, um, real solutions uh, that, that uh, are, are coming from a frame of independent living uh, philosophy. And so those of us who are living with disabilities, we sure have a lot of solutions. I mean, our whole lives are coming up with plan Bs to get around all the plan As that the world puts in front of us um, in this uh not yet fully inclusive world. So um, it is really important to have us at the table giving you real life solutions to the problems that we all face. And so in my mind, nothing about us without us is that voice at the table as Renee said. And so we have to think about people with disabilities as um, from, from, a, from a paradigm of high expectation, not low. Um, we have to think that, of course, they can do that. Of course, they have something to say. Of course, they have something to contribute. Of course, they have contributed. You know, we, we shouldn't be caught up in the incredulousness of, of success on the part of people with disabilities. We know we're successful. We know what we can do. So invite us to the table, just like this right here. We're talking to you right now about the best way to include. And when you look at the terminology that Katie and Tanisha started out with, you know, the AP style guide has poo-pooed words like handicap, uh, handicapable, uh, you know, all those euphemisms, um, uh, uh, wheelchair bound, all that for, for 30 years, but yet we still use those words. So it is important that we use our AP style guide and all the stuff that it's telling us about how to reference people with disabilities. Absolutely. Um, I really like what you said about um, problem solving. Um, what I always say is that um, in order to be a good problem solver, you have to first have problems. And um, that's one thing that I really like about um, 
getting together with other people that are wheelchair users and that have disabilities is that there's so many resources and there's so many different things that I always learn from those situations. Mm -hmm. So just like today, um, it's a great way for people to um, find out information and to find some resources um, like us where if they don't know, they can ask questions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's always, that's great. Um, I, I think it should be an open invitation to the media that is listening now uh, that we are available for questions. You know, I, I think there is no stupid question as we've always heard, you know, use us. I mean, we're out here for that and, and we're not embarrassed by your questions. We're not, uh, you know, uh, offended by, I mean, we would much rather have you ask us and include us in that conversation than get it wrong and then feel the wrath of the disability community. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I would be more than happy to be a resource for sure. So that open invitation. Yep. That's wonderful. Um, and there's so many misconceptions in the media. Um, so I'd like to move on to talk to um, Angie and Tim. I'd like to ask first, Angie, um, how do you address people who are nervous to use common phrases around people with disabilities? such as, did you see that to a blind person or did you hear that about this to a deaf person? Angie, how do you, how do you address people um, who, who are nervous about those phrases or um, who just aren't educated about that or have questions? So I, I wanna kind of piggyback off of what Dan said is that, you know, no question is a bad question. I say it all the time. Um, I lost my sight later in life and, you know, people, it would be very odd if my friends were to call me and say, you know, oh, did you listen to that movie or, you know, things like that. It's okay to use those words. It's okay to say, did you see that? Um, as a matter of fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine. Um, we're not real close, but but she's, she's a dear friend. And, and I was telling her about today. And she said she even feels sometimes like she doesn't want to offend me. And so I told her to please open up and ask me, you know, and if any of you are, are writing a story or, you know, and you, you don't wanna offend somebody, you know, ask, just come out and ask that person. I try to make everybody feel very comfortable. Um, I have a tendency to use humor, um, you know, cause if you get people laughing and, you know, they kind of will start to relax. But I mean, I think it's a normal thing to feel a little nervous and we get that, we understand that. But we also understand that it's okay to ask us questions. You're not going to offend us. Um, I've been asked everything you can possibly think of. And, and it's okay to say, you know, Angie, you know, is looking at this or, you know, had seen this or those words are okay to use, you know. But if you're in question, that's what we're all here for. Um, you know, you can look up each one of us, um, our emails or whatever you need to do to make sure that it's okay. So it's, it's really a great open dialogue today for everybody to just know that to feel comfortable. And if you don't, today is the perfect day to ask those questions. of us. Absolutely. Um, I always, um, am it, in the same situation where people talk about like, um, They'll, they'll say something to me like, let's walk over there. And then they look at me like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that because I'm a mm -hmm. wheelchair user. And then I say, no, that's okay because this is how I walk. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me personally, that's that's how I deal with those situations um, for um, as a wheelchair user. Um, but um, Tim, could you tell me how, how you deal with those situations when, um, when they arise? Um, when you have people that um, just use common phrases that are kind of um, a feel nervous about using certain phrases around you. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said and what, and what what Angie said. I want people to feel comfortable talking with me. I don't want them walking on eggshells. And I think most people, vast, vast, vast majority of people have good intentions. And it's like anything we don't know. We don't know that we've you know, stumbled into something until we've stumbled into it. So there's no shame in that. There's no um, harm in that. There's no embarrassment in that. Now, if people then 
miss that first opportunity to learn and 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 grow then that might become an issue later on but i think you know most people want to do the right thing they want to be friendly they want to be kind and they may use a word that um you know that they might think is a little awkward and i i, I don't think it's awkward to say hey, let's go uh you know or, or did you see that person I, i'm i'm visually impaired i'm not totally blind so i can see things but there are you know similar um circumstances but I, I really want people to to get to know me and i'm unique i think that's where people first language uh i think people first is more important about an attitude than about the actual word the language because we can get hung up on the should i say visually impaired person or should i say person with a vision impairment either one to me that's an adjective that's that's fine it's people's attitude that oh, he's visually impaired, so he represents all people who are visually impaired or all blind people or, you know, get rid of the buckets. That's my, and that's what people first to me means is uh, just because I have a, a, a vision impairment doesn't mean I represent anybody else and what their life experiences. I can speak to my unique experiences and to the, the way I cope and the way I live um, and give some insights, but I don't represent everybody with my condition. Uh, and that to me is, is, is people first. And I love that conversation is person to person. So I don't want to ever put a roadblock in front of somebody who's honestly trying to have a good conversation with me. I'd rather have them be comfortable and just say, hey, that doesn't offend me. But, you know, and if there's a, a teaching opportunity in there or a, you know, a, a learning opportunity, then, you know, then take advantage of that as well. But uh, it's, it's, it's good human interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I like what you said about like a person's intent, you know, what's what their intent is. Um, that says a lot about uh, about what it is they're trying to communicate, or how they're trying to communicate it. And, um, and that part is, um, is important, you know, that, like you said, you don't get hung up necessarily on, on all the words that are used necessarily, but you you know their what their intentions are, and I think a lot of times like that intent is um, is kind of driven by um, their experiences that they've had in the past with people that um, have some sort of a disability. So like um, if they could really kind of see us for um, as independent people that. Um, enjoy life and, and do things out in the community and um, and see us for who we really are, then I think that could really drive that intent towards um, a little different, a little different way of communicating with us or a little different way of seeing us so that then that makes it easier for them to, to ask questions or not be so nervous around us, um, things like that. So yeah, that's a great point that yeah, you made. I agree. And I think, I think, when there's when there's a sense of pity that's that's when i'm not a big i'm not a big fan of of people that before they even know me there's this oh poor poor tim you know yeah. i don't feel like i'm poor tim so yeah yeah exactly that intent that what what's behind it what's driving it that's that's very important and that's a very good point Thanks. um so i would like to let's see we've got uh, Nate is with us today. Um, and journalists need to be sure that they're telling stories that are authentic to the person and not perpetuating stereotypes. So Nate, um, you've been interviewed by the media many times. How do you ensure you aren't being stereotyped within the narrative? So are there any, is there anything that you can do or that you try to think about when you're being interviewed that um, helps drive the story in a positive light um, to instead of being stereotyped? Is there any, anything in particular that you can think of? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question, Tanisha. So the things that immediately come to my mind um, when I interact with journalists, I, I think having a baseline with a person first approach is always a very good idea. And there's a fascinating discussion going on in the chat about person first versus identity first language. And I think we could honestly spend an hour having another one of these talking about that with, with journalists and just getting those perspectives because it is very important. But as a baseline, I think I think person first language is really 
a best practice for journalists when covering the disability community. And some of the best stories I've had emphasize my abilities and my accomplishments and, and de-emphasize my disability entirely. I've done several stories where I don't even mention that I have cerebral palsy because I'm getting to the root of the matter. Uh, the, the Intersecting as a person with a disability, I have challenges with employment, with transportation, with access, with medical care. And, you know, in the best stories, I'm advocating for inclusion in these realms and policy changes and not really focusing on the impact of my disability itself. And really, we shouldn't be focusing on disability unless it's absolutely essential to the story being told. And we want to de-emphasize, we, we don't want to over, over sensationalize things that are happening in our lives just because we want to be included with everyone else doesn't mean we're magically saints you know just because we have disabilities a lot of us have had them all of our lives and we see our world through that prism and we just find ways to adapt and be creative and and be our best selves and contribute uh, to the best way possible. So those things I think are critical to helping the disability community tell its story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we don't necessarily have to focus on the disability unless it's absolutely important to the story. Um, that's a great point. I like that. Um, and um, so I'd, I'd also like to pose the question to Dorita. I know I've seen Dorita, um, she's been interviewed several times. Is there anything in particular um, that you've en encountered with your interviews? Um, anything that you try to do to make sure that uh, you aren't being stereotyped within that interview or anything in particular that you've, you've learned from your experiences being interviewed so many times? Joe Rita. Okay. Um, in my experience, I think if people uh, talk about my disability, I haven't minded that, but I think the important thing is for people not to emphasize our disabilities but to emphasize our abilities. Just because we have a disability doesn't mean that we don't have talents. We can't do other things. And there have been a lot of famous people that um, have had disabilities, such as Stephen Hawking. He was a famous scientist. Marley Matten had hearing loss. Uh, Robert David Hall was an amputee, and he was on CSI. We have, we have a, the abil ability to do a lot of special things, and we have talents, and I've encouraged people to um, focus on my talents and the talents of people that have had disabilities were we are people with a disability that disability does not define us i have red hair but that doesn't make me special and the fact that i have a disability does not make me special that's not people first language i think People need to um, remember, and the media particularly, that we've made accomplishments. We have dreams and hopes. We've contributed to the community. And we want to be included, just like everyone else. And when we can be seen in that light, 
I think things will be a lot better for us. Absolutely. Yeah, I like um, what you said about the disability does not define us and uh, about your how red you having red hair does not necessarily define you. Um, because that's something that everyone can relate to everybody. Everyone has um, a different color of hair, but that whether they're uh, someone that's able-bodied, for lack of a better word, or there's somebody that has a disability, um, that's something everyone can relate to and that they can all um, understand that just because we have a certain color hair, it doesn't necessarily define us. So that it was a great point. I really like that one. Um, so thank you very much for those questions, for those um, answers to my questions. I have a couple more here. Um, Let's see, social media is a mode to communicate with younger generations. Anna, can you tell us what apps you use and how you get your information? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll make an introduction about me. I'm Anna McGuire. I am doing early childhood education major. So I'm supporting for, um, for tons of family through the social media about the really good resources. Because there are some people who needed some support from other people who have experience with hearing loss. For the social media, I am using Instagram and Facebook since 2013. I am using, they had a really, really good closed caption along inside of a setting. They have really good subtitle and they had a really good sign language but I wrote it on something on here. There's something really, really good. Um, there we go. Okay. The Facebook and Instagram are great apps to educate other followers who have no idea what it's like having disability, like hearing loss. I have a really good example what I learned as I thought about sign language program would be only for deaf and hard hearing community. But I realized it's for everyone. Everyone can be including to learn in, in ASL and not just excluded from deaf and hard hearing. Some family have maybe the only child who is deaf um, the other children may need a different combination, like closed caption, alternative language using visual picture. <laughs> um, especially video, there's a really, really good video of giving good resources. Um, an example would be a young girl on Instagram told me how her, um, I would say illness, delay her communication skill and how did she learn in ASL? Um, let me see. Ah, an individual with health problem chose an American Sign Language. So we know America's sign language and English are different. Because when you see America's sign language, you will see some of the words are skip. Instead of using R is um, N, and it's just a lot of different, but we see English sign language is more, I would say, not about the master, but it's more clear by language than using ASL. Like me, I am 
using the first language was ASL. Then I received my cochlear implant. Um, I struggle in English language and needed some help from other people, like tutors, um, my parents, my friends, and other people. There are great supporters to help them. Uh, I think. Um, let me see. So your friends, your family, and the support system you've had have been a big help. Um, and along with um, some of the apps that you mentioned there in the beginning. Um, yeah. There's, okay, gotcha. Um, do you have a really good program for those people with cochlear implants and hearing aid? You can do a hearing practice hearing with English inside of it. Another thing I like is Google Classroom. I get some help with this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Those sound like really good resources. Thank you so much, Anna. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. We have one more question. Okay. How people are portrayed in the media can impact others' opinions on disability. Jeannie, uh, let's see, Jeannie, yes, sorry. Um, do you think seeing stories of individuals with Down syndrome, how do you think seeing stories of individuals with Down syndrome or autism affects the self-esteem of other kids and adults? Let me repeat that. How do you think seeing stories of individuals with Down syndrome or autism affects the self-esteem of other kids and adults? And we, when we say stories, we mean like um, um, uh, news um, stories or um, things that you see on the television on television that has to to do with um, stories about people with Down syndrome or autism. I think that it largely can have a positive impact just so long as it is celebrating uh, the achievements, the abilities, the impact and the hard work of those individuals. My son's four, but he has to work hard for, for everything he does. So as long as it's celebrating that hard work and spotlighting that individual, like when Chris Nickich completed the Ironman, uh, as a first individual to do are wonderful and they're celebrating the possibilities that there are. Um, or Heidi Crowder over in England is working very hard right now, challenging the high courts as a, a woman with Down syndrome um, through some medical discrimination. So stories like that are wonderful. I think that there are, you know, stories sometimes that are intended to be heartwarming though, that can occasionally, I think, be problematic for communities, such as, you know, situations where maybe we wanted to do a, a story on someone taking their, you know, uh, friend with Down syndrome to prom and maybe we're over celebrating someone just having a friendship with someone that's got disabilities. Um, I think those, while they, you know, are uplifting can be sort of damaging in the same way. I think someone would be lucky to go to prom with my son. He's, <laughs> he's adorable. And <laughs> He's definitely a character. So I think as long as we are making sure that we're focused on, you know, celebrating all of the achievements and, like I said, possibilities of individuals with disabilities, you know, if someone came out to the buddy walk and saw the wonderful community we have in Toledo of, of people living with Down syndrome as well as their families, things like that are great. Just so maybe someone who's not familiar with all of our uh, parents and children can kind of get a glimpse into, um, you know, the types of things we're doing. And it's okay to even include challenges, obviously. Um, you know, my son does have things that, like I mentioned, are harder work for him. So I don't think we should glaze over the, you know, hurdles that people face that's, you know, disingenuous in, in portraying it as, you know, all easy and, um, sunshine, but I think as long as, as the intent is there to make sure that we're focusing on that individual and we're not sort of creating a scenario where, or that person sort of seen as a, 
mascot or someone who's to be pitied or, um, you know, not like a charity case, but yes, I, I, I do prefer to have people kind of pivot away from those, you know, moments where we're celebrating someone just being treated as a normal part of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, well, let's see, we've got, I'd like to ask Jennifer the same question. Um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what, how you think seeing stories of individuals with Down syndrome or autism affects the self-esteem of, of children or adults who also have Down syndrome or autism? Of course. Um, while I cannot speak and I will not speak for those with Down syndrome because I am not a part of that community, um, mm -hmm. I can speak for autistic um, adults and children. And I will say, first and foremost, I use identity first language, at least for myself. The reason being is that often autism, when someone has autism, there's a fear that, oh, underneath the autism, there's a normal person who with a normal brain. And that's no, 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 no. You try to cure my autism and you change me as a person irrevitably. So... I use first and first language. That is not to say that someone from another disabled group cannot say no. I want first person and you need to use that. So there is a difference. This is just how myself and a majority of the autistic community prefers to be identified as. But it is different for everyone. So my mm -hmm. word is not law. Um, but going into the um, self-esteem, that is a rather subjective question. While understandable, the reason why it's subjective is that everybody thinks differently. Um, one, one autistic character in fiction can be highly relatable for a specific person, while another individual might find that character unrelatable or even offensive. Um, if I were to assume that everybody felt the same in a very community, I would be ignoring a big percentage of it. And that's often a mistake that creators have when trying to portray autism. Uh, what I can say is that autistic, autistic people were often put in a box by the media. And generally that narrative is of a straight white male, uh, you know, a character who, you know, is very skilled at a few things. Maybe they're great at often it's science trains and whatever else, but, you know, they need help in other portions of their lives. And while that might be the case for some in the community, such a character doesn't cover every aspect of the autistic community, and it would be impossible for that character to do so. Or the narrative focuses on a family in the community that's affected by this person, but doesn't show the actual autistic character themselves and how they feel on the situation. They're not a character. They are just, they are either an obstacle or they are a prop for, you know, whatever main character it is to learn about them. And that's not mm -hmm. exactly good when you want actual representation the autistic community, they don't get anything. They're just like, well, this isn't about me. This is about you. Mm -hmm. So, and also what ends up happening for the people who, you know, are not white males, they may not get a diagnosis for a long time because they don't relate to those characters. Like I'm female. If I see, let's go with a really old example. Um, let's go with Rain Man. I am not that character, <laughs> clearly. I am not a savant. Um, or they may not be considered autistic due to preconceived notions of autism popular within the media. Um, but in my case, if we were talking about my own self-esteem, when I see poor uh, representation for an autistic person, I don't feel ashamed or scared that I'll be judged by the wider, wider society because I'm already judged. There's really, like, you can compound it, but it's all the same to me. What I feel is disappointment and frustration because there, because there clearly wasn't any consulting from an autistic person during production, or there was, 
but their advice was not considered. And that isn't, you know, anything, nothing with us, without us, you know, that is just, oh, we're just a set piece, like the character you're creating. Um, so what affects the autistic community the most, in my opinion, when it comes to representation, is a lack of diversity, diversity, uh, sorry, diversity, I can speak, no worries, and a perceived reluctance from creators to care for autistic voices. Mm -hmm. When you have something, and you can let me know if I'm going over time, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, when you yeah. have a disability, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. You have a, uh, a few, I guess like a, a minute or two, and then we'll go on to questions. Go ahead. Cool. Um, I will say when you have a disability that comes in a variety of forms, you could say a spectrum, um, you want to have multiple narratives. You want to have different elements of this community or else you're going to just have one and it's probably going to be the same narrative that we've always seen or it's going to be focused on the family, something we have always seen. Um, so we can have characters be flawed. We don't need to just focus on the positives all the time. You can have an autistic person be a person. You can have anyone from any other, you know, uh, community be a person because um, we're all human. So it's that that's where I come from mostly. Thank you. Gotcha. I like what you said about um, how it's okay to show those flaws. Um, and, um, and Jeannie said the same thing too, just being real about the challenges. Um, it kind of, I think it opens up um, uh, it helps us to open other people's eyes about what life is really like and it gives a whole picture and it might help um, their perspective a little bit, um, help other people to understand a little bit more. Um, and then it also may be um, somebody um, who's also going through some of the same challenges, it might help them um, to know that there's other people out there that are dealing with some of the same challenges as well because um, you know, sometimes it's hard to put those those um, challenges out there, but um, if it helps somebody else, um, that may be a way to um, to make it a little bit easier. So I'm glad that you guys brought those points that you two brought those points up, and um, and uh, they're good ones, I think for sure. So, um, all right. Well, we have come to the end of our questions. Um, thank you so much for answering those um, for us from our panelists. Now we are at the um, question and answer period um, that we have for a few minutes here at the end. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask um, for our panelists? I know we have a lot of things going on, had a lot of things going on in our chat. Um, That was mostly about uh, person first um, language, which is kind of interesting. Some of the things that people were talking about there. Um, let's see. Does anyone else have any other questions? I, I would just like to say uh, briefly that what we really need to look at is the interaction between the media person and the individual. And I think it starts with the media person not assuming anything about the individual uh, because disability as, as many people have referenced here comes at you one person at a time and, and no two people with spinal cord injuries are alike, no two people with cerebral palsy, no people, two people with autism have all the exact same issues, you know, uh, or needs or, or wants or dreams. You know, we're all individuals. So you have the, idios you have the idiosyncrasy uh, uh, of the individual and you also have all of the various variables that every disability has within its uh, umbrella. And so I think just not assuming anything. And then the most important thing I think is, is the ask, you know, if you have a question, if you uh, wonder anything, I think just ask the individual, as Nate was saying up front, it doesn't have to be a disability. There doesn't have to be a disability link at all. They may have come in with that, but it doesn't need to be that at all. I think it's really important that we, have that conversation up front. Um, how do you want me to reference you? You know, if I was a media person writing a story, I would ask the individual, how do you want to be referred to? You know, mm -hmm. do you like person first? Are you all right with identity first? You know, a lot of us are very proud of our disabilities and that's hard for somebody without a disability 
to wrap their head around, but a lot of us are very proud of, of, of who we are as disabled people. And we, we value our disabilities. I, I am a whole better human being because of what I've been through as a chair user. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, but that's so hard for a non-disabled person to even wrap their head around. But it is true. So when we, were, when we define ourselves as a, as a, as a, a chair user or um, a cord or whatever we call ourselves as somebody with a disability, you know, we, you know, that's the language we use because we're proud of who we are and we, we understand um, what that disability has taught us about being human and humane. So I think it's important for the, the media person to ask the individual that they're mm -hmm. interviewing or referencing in their story, how would they like to be referenced? What's the best way for me to refer to you? And then that way there's no assumptions and there's, there's no problems. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you say, can I add something? Sure, go ahead, Renee. Oftentimes when the media talks about minority issues, we are totally left out. They talk about black and brown and LGBTQ, which is great, but they never ask people with disabilities. And we often struggle with the same kind of a person, maybe in a different way, but it's the same type of a person. Absolutely. I, don't, I just don't know why they can't add disability on the end of LGBTQ. Why can't we be included in that? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that um, we are a minority. Um, and that um, we should be included in with some of the minorities that are more, that are discussed in the media um, more often. Um, I know that like a lot of times um, for me as a wheelchair user, like if I go into a building um, that's not accessible in the front, we're always brought around to the back. Um, there's a lot of ways that we're segregated. Um, and uh, so I think that that's a great point that we could be um, included in as a minority. Um, and uh, there's a great saying that um, I've heard before, and I think Tim Harrington uses it. Um, uh, a disability is the only minority that anyone can join at any time. We're, e um, we're an equal opportunity minority group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I have a couple so of I questions, think... it looks like, in the chat. Okay. All right, we've got uh, we've got uh, just just a couple minutes here. Um, how do we address the media's typical representation of all people with disabilities as wheelchair users? Because is it is a clear visual representation? Does anyone want to take that one? I I can if you want. Sure. Rather quick and snippy. Um, yeah. Be more creative. Honestly, you have so many ways. To depict a person, you, it doesn't always have to be visual. The greatest stories are ones where they take the mind of a person and, you know, give them obstacles, give them chances, build up a story. It, it's really nice to have a prop, but people aren't props. People are people. So you don't always need a visual identifier. Just like if I were to go with another autistic stereotype, you don't always need a straight edged, you know, you know, yeah, straight edged, you know, hair always one way, you know, visual signifiers. Just, you know, that's another thing. Just consult people, be more mm -hmm. creative. That's all I have to say. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question here. Um, what about the phrase differently abled? I think I think what they're asking is what, what we think about the phrase differently abled, if we think it's appropriate. And my opinion is that um, it's, it's sort of skirting around the, um, instead of saying um, disabled, they're, they're like skirting around that. 
they don't want to say disabled so they're they're finding a cute little way to say to say disabled because almost like it's a bad word um in my opinion so um i just like to come right out with it and say that i'm i'm someone that's uh disabled that is a wheelchair user um does anyone else have any other opinions about that I was, oh, oh, I do. Go ahead. I do. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Does. Everybody does. I think we all do. <laughs> Somebody hit a button. <laughs> Somebody hit a hot point. I, I, I have a thought on that. And I, I, I don't like to say that I'm disabled. I like to say that I have an impairment or I have, I have a, you know, a vision impairment or, a, or a, a disability, but I don't, I don't like to say that I'm disabled. That I think that is self-talk for me that isn't good for me to hear about myself. So that's just my own personal thing is that it's, uh, no, I have an impairment. Other people may have things that I think are far worse, like um, horrible attitudes or impatient. You know, there's a lot of things that people have that aren't even considered disabilities that I think uh, are more you know, damaging to somebody's life than a vision impairment. And I agree with what, what Dan said earlier. I, th I think having a, you know, lived a life with an, with the, uh, an impairment like this, it, it does strengthen you. And it, it's something that you're, you're proud that you have, um, it's shaped who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you want everybody in the world to have it, but it has, it has shaped who we are in our own ways. Absolutely. I think a Anybody lot of us know? have issues. I think a lot of us have issues with the, with the euphemisms people use for us, you know, handicapable, uh, all, all the stuff, you know, right. um, just, we're just folks, you know, we're just yeah. folks with disabilities. We live, on, we, and I always say people living with disabilities because so often we forget the living part. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all living our lives and we're just going from A to B with as few hassles as possible. I think that's what everybody in the world wants. So there's a lot more that we have in common, um, whether it's visible or not visible. We all want to be loved. We all want to have friends. We all want to belong to something bigger. We all want to be able to contribute and give back. That stuff that is, is, um, uh, uh, unique across the uh, humanity you know it isn't just um, those of us with disabilities that, that were that different you know so you're just you know people say what do I call you I say call me Dan Dan works really great you know you'll always get my attention <laughs> that doesn't work for me <laughs> so, yeah. but, but yeah that's the thing you know we take it too seriously a lot of times people take our disabilities way more seriously than we do and that's just yeah. another barrier we have to deal with yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I was this addresses that whole tokenism <laughs> thing that somebody was talking about too. Yeah, um, there is a question about representation versus tokenism, and I think just really quickly re um, referencing that, you know, I think if you know we're seeing people in the media with disabilities, but we're not like focusing solely on the disability and making the story all about overcoming the disability and oh how inspirational they are because. They're going out and doing their job every day. That's something that everybody does. So I think there is a difference between making it, you know, making someone a token and a look at them, they're the person with the disability, um, as opposed to they're a person with a disability living their lives. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think seeing that representation and seeing that in the media for me is great. Like seeing other people with disabilities going out in the world and doing amazing things is wonderful. But then if we put that inspirational spin on that, sometimes we can definitely head into tokenism territory. Yeah. I no think violins. So. We don't need violin or soft <laughs> right. piano music behind our stories. Please stop doing that. <laughs> well, it's gotta be a real up. sweet violin. <laughs> to sum it up, though, I think um, we've all talked a lot of, about uh, how important it is for um, questions to be asked, how we're all different and we all have different needs. We all have uh, differences that um, only we know the answers to those questions. So um, we are open to questions. We are uh, good contacts for people who have questions. So um, please ask us and please um, just please get in contact with, with us in the future. If you have any questions, please just let us know. And uh, we appreciate all the panelists for being with us today. Um, thank you everyone who's been watching today. Uh, it's such an important conversation to have and we're 
um, we've just, it's, it's been wonderful to, to have it. And I love all of the answers and it just, it filled my cup today. So I hope it did yours. And um, I hope everyone has an absolutely wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay safe.